Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on artisans this afternoon. My name is Jo Thomas. I am the CEO and creative director of a multi arts organisation here in Brisbane called Metro Arts. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here and to moderate this session this afternoon. I would like to, of course, acknowledge that um, I am on Turrbal and Yagara land here in Brisbane, and I acknowledge the elders and the ancestors, and of course, the young ones who are coming through to hopefully make a better future for us all. We have three fabulous fellows this afternoon who are going to speak to you about their practices. Um, and we're coming to you from all over the place this afternoon. Uh, we're in Northern New South Wales, we're in New Mundi in Queensland, uh, we're here in Brisbane, and we're also in New York, New York. So it's gonna be a great session. To kick off, we have Christina Waterson. So Christina um, is a 2010 fellow, and she undertook to study the origins of patterns and their relation to three-dimensional spaces and objects. And her fellowship saw her travel around the world to Japan, China, Hong Kong, Turkey, and the UK. Christina began her career in design and architecture, defining and creating spaces to meet the specific requirements of each brief and project, focusing on the nuts and bolts of design, planning and materials. It's great to have you with us, Christina. Um, over to you, this is Altered Space. Thanks, Jo. This is me. I used to live in Brisbane City for many years in Highgate Hill in an apartment way above the ground. Life was complex. My art was complex. It was sharp, regimented, certain and rule based. In hindsight, too, I realise now that I wore way too much black. I focused on large scale public art projects. I didn't share my more personal drawings, photographs and constructions. Stretching across buildings, my public artworks were made up of hundreds of individual elements. They were scaled to their environment, site specific and very, very public. The relentless geometry of these works demanded absolute precision and accuracy throughout every stage of the process. They were made of hard materials, including coated mild steel, aluminium, acrylic, perspex, plywood, and timber. Because the materials were hard, the resulting artworks were also hard, angular and sharp. They were difficult to make. For warranty and procurement purposes, they were made by others using large scale manufacturing processes. During this time, I started to feel disconnected from my art practice and my artworks. A shift started within me. My public works, I moved inside and started to soften them. Botanical 2017 realised in the interior of Student One's foyer in Wharf Street, Brisbane, records this very subtle shift in my work.
Leading up to my 40th birthday, I moved to Federal in northern New South Wales. Here I was surrounded by nature, having spent most of my childhood in the bush. This felt like a coming home. I was grounded, gardening every day, bushwalking and breathing in and out again. That's around the time I fell in love. Strangely and unexpectedly, this coupled with my new surroundings led to an opening up of my creative practice and the rediscovery of the love I'd once had for the process of making artwork. The Byron School of Art supported me in this quest for love and it shifted my understanding of what my artwork actually is. Gone is a focus on the precision and certainty of hard geometry and the exacting nature of large scale sculptural works. Now I share my private drawings my personal constructions, the usually unseen photographs, the collages that have always been part of my process. I enjoy the directness of drawing. It's immediate. Whatever is going on for me in my inner world appears on the page. I find myself using drawing as a way of expressing ideas beyond representation. The hand drawn grids form unique recordings of the imperfections of my hands and my breath. They also show the limits of my attention span. The drawings are responsive and uncertain. Bad Grid 2019, which is the, the largest drawing on this slide, came about while I was trying to make something else. I'd set out to make a perfect grid. I wanted to form it into a small sculpture, like the one in the bottom row of this slide, the small red one. However, halfway through, I'd made a massive mistake. Instead of throwing the drawing away and starting over, which is what I would usually do, I decided to continue the drawing to the end. And I included the words bad grid in the center of the drawing. Looking at the finished work on my desk, I found it hard to accept that this was an artwork that I shared and that I would call my own. How would others take it? It was imperfect, awkward, and ugly and really different to anything I'd made before. I put it to the side. Much later, to my surprise, I found people resonated strongly with it. I believe that's because it showed vulnerability and my unique sense of humor. At first glance, it actually looks like the misshapen, badly drawn letters spell out the words, bad girl. Masks, templates and discarded elements used in the making of the work have become the work itself. 
With them are my attempts and failures to achieve perfection. My photographs of everyday moments bear witness to the strangeness and ambiguity of reality and the uncertainty of our times. Jude's turn was captured in July 2019, months before the bushfires of that summer. My artist statement reads, a typical family barbecue is about to take a turn for the worse. Distracted from the excitement of the slip and slide by the unexpected danger suddenly moving towards him, Jude stands frozen. He is at a threshold. Should he take his turn or should he turn and run away? The climate crisis is here and it will greatly impact our future, our everyday life and our children. What have we done? Now it's Jude's turn to face the consequences of our action and our inaction. The photographs also trace my personal transformation of being in the moment. If I'm moved to pick up a camera and take a photo, then the image retains something inherent for me to look at more deeply later. The photographs are unstaged, taken as they are everyday moments. Collage supports this playful discovery. It helps me to see with fresh eyes, to find a work's essence, its balance, and transition points. Gathering 2020 captures our ability to still hope through these uncertain times. The everyday objects and the way we use public places have been redefined by the pandemic. The hodgepodge of chairs sitting within the neglected art school hall marks our absence from communal assembly and our loss of physical connection to each other. In 2020, the small community of Billy Nudgel decided to revive and renovate this School of Art Hall in the hope that one day soon we'd gather together again. My partner and I had planned to move our life to Portugal by June 2020. Our plans were foiled when it, the pandemic hit the world earlier that year. We had to stay put. We had to make do. We ended up leasing a commercial studio in Billy Nudgel. This is a moment from one of our daily afternoon walks around the tiny village. The boat stranded far from the ocean was akin to how we'd found ourselves washed up far from where we'd planned to be. At the time, Billy Nudgel felt as far away from Portugal as one could get. Billy Nudgel became our creative home and ended up being our lifesaver.
The original artwork entitled Shrine to Unsuccess grew out of a conversation with my partner. He always had this amazing unwavering belief in me, unconditional love. I often found it awkward and hard to love myself in that same way. It was difficult to accept the damaged parts of me, the painful and ugly parts. Being bullied in primary school for being different had left me feeling like an outsider, an intruder, unworthy of love and acceptance. He showed me it's okay to be vulnerable and that it's safe to open up, to break down and to not be so perfect. Personally and professionally, Shrine to Unsuccess was transformative. It included my failures, the artwork I'd made, but were unseen, unwanted, unexhibited, incomplete, returned, rejected, worn, damaged, and broken. The artwork installation was shared alongside my photographs, drawings, and small scale sculptures as part of the Dance This Mess Around exhibition at the Byron School of Art in 2019 in, in Mullumbimby. Through my photographs, drawings, and small scale sculptures, I continue the work of accepting things around me as they are and accepting myself for who I am, flaws and all. Some things I can change, some things I accept I can't change, and I continue to make mistakes. After all, what actually defines success? This work is entitled Yield 2021. Growing up, my mother had always said that our biggest defeats can also be our making. They present an opportunity to grow and to better understand ourselves. I came across this damaged road sign at a time in my life when I felt utterly defeated. This forlorn image resonated with me deeply. Since then, I've come to the realization that I am not broken. There's nothing to fix. I accept and yield to who I am, exactly as I am. Failures, have the potential to become a great success. Presently, I have two artworks traveling throughout regional Australia. The first work, I Am Here 2019, is a finalist in the Manning Regional Galleries 2021 Naked and Nude Award Exhibition. I Am Here is a naked photographic self-portrait. I'll conclude my presentation with the other work that's currently touring around Australia, A Secret Truth a finalist in the 2020 Jacaranda Acquisitive Drawing Prize, or JADA for short. JADA is a national biennial award for drawing. At the heart of this award is a broad conversation 
about exactly what drawing is and what it can be. The Jada celebrates the way that direct mark making has endured through time. To have my work, especially a sculptural work included in this award, places it in that ongoing, playful and lively conversation. As my practice is mostly known for being predominantly sculpture based, I set myself the task of responding to the challenge of the Jada, not with just a sculptural work, but a work that evolves directly from the foundation of drawing. A secret truth emerged slowly from a pencil drawn grid, transforming the overt structure of the straight line into the softness yet strength of the curve. I began to refer to the work as a spine and realized that that's exactly what it is. A secret truth represents the challenge of standing tall and beyond that of standing up for oneself something I've personally struggled with for years. The work stands tall within a custom made vitrine based on the proportions of my body. It bears witness to the changes in me and my art practice. Ultimately, this work is a self portrait. By their nature, the works are all portraits. My vulnerability, struggles and joys gather quietly out in the open. The work is a way to accept my past lives and histories and to also connect with my rediscovered physical body and innate sensuality. I am relieved to glimpse my own humanity and flaws as I continue to step into the present and into love. Throughout this process of change and the feeling of groundlessness that change brings, especially in the altered space of our changing world, the teachings and words of Chogram Trumpa have kept me open and kept me curious. In his own words, the bad news is you're falling through the air. Nothing to hang on to, no parachute. The good news is there's no ground. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was a very personal and um, very brave presentation. I absolutely love that quote at the end, falling through the air. Um, we're going to do questions at the end of the full session, but um, for those of you, I can see you out there um, joining us. Please feel free to put your questions in the live Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if it is specifically for Christina, just mark it that way and we'll come back and we'll answer the questions after the other speakers. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Jo. I'm now going to bring, oh, he's here already, Daniel from the Green Room, Hello. the stage. Hello. Um, Daniel is joining us from New York, so thank you for getting up um, out of bed. Um, 
Daniel Tobin studied a Bachelor of Art in Visual Arts at the Queensland University of Technology. And while studying, Daniel worked for a small Brisbane-based art production company, delivering semi-permanent site-wide um, human factor program for Expo 88 in Brisbane. A year after finishing art college, Daniel studied design at NIDA in Sydney, graduating in 1993. And then the same year, he co-founded Urban Art Projects with his brother, Matthew Tobin, um, which is still going great guns, such a fantastic company. Uh, Daniel is a pretty recent fellow from 2018, and he's going to talk to you this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, um, about what his research was with his fellowship. And he was um, benchmarking public art projects that infuse creativity and culture, whilst also stimulating commerce to benefit the community. It sounds really fascinating. Daniel, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon to all those attending the National Convention of Church of Fellows and the Changing World. My name is Daniel Tobin. I'm a 2018 fellow and my field of study was visual arts. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Jagera and Turrupal peoples, the traditional owners of, of the land on which we gather, and all First Nations people attending the conference especially artists and makers whose knowledge and craft continue to inform us today. I'm speaking to you from Rock Tavern in the Lower Hudson Valley, New York, and acknowledge the Muncie peoples as the traditional stewards of this land. I'd also like to acknowledge the Churchill Trust that has supported Australians like me to travel overseas and conduct research in the chosen field. For me, it was a revelation, being able to step out of my everyday work environment and to meet people with, meet and talk with people who are passionate, thoughtful and driven about making a difference in the field of public art. By way of introduction, I'm one of four boys born and bred on Kwandamuka country in Moreton Bay. I was born in the late sixties. My mother was still was and still is the matriarch of our family, a bio teacher, union rep, and strident feminist. My father dabbled in art making when he was a youth, was a chemist by trade, then a fruiterer, and now in his 80s, a winemaker at Ballandine, just outside Brisbane. He's also a self-declared workaholic. For better or for worse, we're all a mashup of our parents. And my brother and my twin brother Matt and I did not fall far from that tree. At high school, I was a very uncommitted student until an inspiring art teacher by the name of Diane Townton opened my eyes up to the possibilities of art. Under her guidance, I was accepted to art school and my whole world changed. A year later, my brother followed me to art school and while we were studying at Covent Grove, we worked in a small art foundry in Red Hill. That business was part of a cohort of art and design firms that worked on projects for Expo 88 in Brisbane. It was the first time I'd experienced the sense of what a creative public space could be my passion for public art was born then. And five years later, we set up our first workshop in a tiny shed in Jindalee. In the following years, we've been able to work with artists on projects across Australia and around the world, sharing our production know-how to realise public projects big and small. Why the church hop? After spending 28 years as a public art practitioner, I wanted to know more about what we did, how we could do it, and how we could do it better. And the Churchill Fellowship provided that opportunity. 
the great architect and urbanist Lee Kabusia said in his classic 1929, The City of Tomorrow, expressed, we are fond of the crown and the crush. I always love that line. I love the hustle and bustle of a city with the streets in constant flux and, the, and a smell of anticipation in the air. With two thirds of the world's population living in urban centers by 2050, public art will play a crucial role in creating safe, livable and equitable spaces for communities to grow and flourish. It's the title of this year's conference suggests we are in a rapidly changing world. Our generation and the next are dealing with uh, multiple issues of uh, the equity and inclusion, the existential threat of climate change to humanity and most other species on Earth all amplified by a global pandemic. I think it's fair to say, we've got to rethink what we do and how we do it. It's exciting and frightening all at once. My Churchill took me to expected and unexpected places. I traveled to the US, UK and Norway, meeting commissioners, curators and artists, working with and with, uh, within the public art e ecosystem and outside it. I saw projects in San Fran, Las Vegas, Chicago, Houston, New York, London, and Oslo. And I met the people and practitioners that delivered them. I had conversations with policy writers, public space mavericks, marketeers, and long-term public art tragics. I put myself into that last category and ventured into regional parklands, city plazas and squares, austere and enlightened government offices, the digs of non-for-profits, artist studios, two deserts and an underground border catchment. And I saw art, lots of art, and asked a lot of questions about how, the how, what, where and why. I was looking for that secret source, that mix of ingredients, that made these public art projects fantastic. They say it takes a village to raise a child. The same can be said about bringing art into this world. This is a who's who in the zoo of the public art ecosystem. It requires a small army of players to conceive, nurture, design, engineer, make, install, and maintain public art. There are planners and policy makers that help create the rules of engagement. Commissioners and exhibition partners who exhibit the work. Curators who guide, artists who lead the creative, along with a slew of designers, engineers, makers, and producers to come together to realize the final outcome. I'll talk about all of them in this presentation, or some of them, and some of the projects I've delivered. I love this space, the thinkers and planners. These people are hovering way above us assessing things on a macro level, looking at our cities, communities, and how to, to design them better. The San Francisco Arts Commission on the West Coast of the US is a benchmark agency for cities all over the world. And people for public space have helped cities imagine their futures and build strong communities through creating great public spaces. Public art practice of the late 20th and early 21st centuries has been heavily influenced by 
FDR's Federal One New Deal back to work programs established in 1933 to rebuild the US economy after the impact of the Great Depression. Lena Roosevelt championed the New Deal to promote American art and culture and to give Americans access to what the president described as an abundant life. The fund employed arts workers of all types with visual artists employed in decoration of public buildings and parks, a precursor to the contemporary citywide public art percent, the citywide percent for art programs. San Francisco Arts Commission was established in 1932, just a year before FDR's New Deal programs. With a mission to champion the arts as an essential as essential to daily life, this forward-thinking city agency invests in local arts community, activates the urban environment and shapes cultural policy, guiding and strengthening the community. They roll out 2% for art programs to ensure that both public buildings, a 2% policy, and private developers, a 1% policy, are required to invest in art and culture. Property grants also allow arts organisations to expand their footprints and facilities. The streets and communities in the are activated through uh, temporary public art exhibitions and programmes and uh, underprivileged uh, communities uh, are served with cultural equity endowment, in the cultural equ equity endowment. Big struggle for arts agencies and organizations is always funding. In the US, um, most of the funding comes through the private sector. Um, San Francisco Arts Commission was one of the first agencies or US cities to link arts to tourism. Their hotel, motel, occupancy tax for the arts was introduced way back in 1961 and it provided secure source of funding for over 50 years. There was a slight hiccup in 2003 where some political interference rescinded those funds for five years, but the community fought back and voted strongly to reinstate funding through property, a huge win for um, artists and, and art workers. Please meet Fred and Fred Kent and Kathy Madden, the public space man, mavericks I mentioned before, before. In 1975, they set up Project for Public Space as a three-year project, a three-year initiative to prove the value of public spaces. Over the next 40 years, they have led the global discussion and helped over two and a half thousand communities in 50 countries all around the world reimagine their futures through public space. The CEO, Phil Merrick, offers great counsel on the importance of common ground, as he, as he says, that we can all share, participate in, socialize and enjoy strengthening our communities for the future. Integral to PPS's placemaking is an approach to design and manage public spaces with the communities who use them daily. PBS played a significant role in transforming some of, some of New York's most undesirable and unutilized public spaces. In the 80s, they developed a set of recommendations that would kickstart start the transformation of Bryant Park from an unsafe, drug-dominated ghetto into the much-loved public space it is today. This marked one of the most influential models for public space in the US uh, and beyond. The same principles that have informed and influenced that development of people, the development of people places in the US um, has delivered projects like Houston's Discovery Green, New York's Times Square, and our own Centenary Square in Parramatta. 
the organization's thought leadership and impact over the last five decades has been remarkable. They coined placemaking, uh, which is phenomenal. They also established the Urban Parks Institute to develop strategies for neighborhood park management. And post 9-11, uh, they developed the lighter, quicker, cheaper methodology for improving public space. City changes are integral players in public art within the city they inhabit, whether through a visionary leader, a city waiting, wanting transformational change, or a derelict precinct seeking to reinvent itself. All three organizations have delivered extraordinary benefits to the communities that they serve. Millennium Park is a phenomenal story. The Millennium Park effect was coined to explain the momentous and lasting impact this project had on the city and the people of Chicago. The sheer audacity of Anish Kapoor's cloud gate and Juan Plenza's Grand Fountain were instrumental in transforming the ailing northern industrial city of Chicago into a global cultural and tourist destination. With a can-do attitude, the city and philanthropic partners delivered far beyond Mayor Daly's wildest ambitions. Two million people visited the park in its first six months and expectations were high for annual visitations uh, with for annual visitations to exceed 3 million. When I visited in mid-2019, Scott Stewart, the director of the foundation, explained that visitation rates had now climbed to 25 million annually, an extraordinary tale of success. Kapoor speaks of Cloudgate as reflecting what's around it, the, the Chicago horizon, the Chicago skyline, bringing Chicago into itself in a way. Iconic, ambitious, yet respectful of place, the work sits somewhere between art and architecture and captivates audience near and far. Public art was one part of the puzzle of Millennium Park success. It sat beside uh, Destination Architecture by Frank Gehry, Renzo Piano, and landscape architect, architect Catherine Gustafsson. Plenza was sure his work for Crown Fountain would never be realized. His dreams for the work far exceeded the $10 million budget. There was pushback from key decision makers worried if it was right for the project, saying things like too big, two times square, or an it's an exercise in pomposity. Plans are held firm though, suggesting that if you can reduce the scale of Chicago, then I can reduce the scale of my work. The work was realized in full with two 50 foot glass towers placed at either end of an inch deep reflection pond. 1000 faces of locals appear one by one on the towers. Randomly selected, they represent the diversity of the city through gender, age and ethnicity. This is destination art at its boldest drawing together people from across the city and around the world. It has changed how the locals perceive themselves and the how, how the rest of the world thinks of them. The Public Art Fund is another institution that has returned um, huge benefit to the city of New York. Founded by Doris Friedman in 1977, the fund has been working with emerging and established artists to deliver regular exhibitions of contemporary art for neighborhoods throughout the city for over 40 years. 
Today, Chief Curator Nicholas Bohm and Director Susan Friedman, the daughter of the founder, remain sed steadfast in their commitment to bringing artworks outside the traditional context of museums and galleries. The Public Art Fund provides a unique platform for an unparalleled public account encounter with the art of our time. EAF has presented more than 500 artist projects in streets, parks, and public places in the five boroughs. All exhibitions are temporary and they can be on show from just a day to up to a year. Curated to engage a diverse audience, artists come from all over the world and generally create site-specific responses that speak to the community and the city they inhabit. Looking back on PAF's exhibition history, there is an overwhelming connection with commissioned works and the social history of the city. Agnes Denny's Wheatfield in Lower Manhattan, uh, delivered in 1975, brought attention to what might be lost as old neighborhoods were raised in the name of growth and advancement. More recently, Ai Weiwei's citywide Good Fences Make Good Neighbours spoke to the artist's very personal experience of New York as a foreign national living and studying in the city. The exhibition spoke of greater issues, migration and the acceptance of others. With 300 works scattered across the city, um, it spoke to tens of millions of people. The, ex the exhibition was experienced uh, by many over its five month ins installation and it's claimed that there were trillions of impressions seen online around the world. Public Art Fund is, essential, is an essential part of the city's arts ecosystem and plays a part and is a part of every New Yorker's daily life. Times Square Arts exemplifies how public art and programming can be a key ingredient for change. The Times Square Alliance formed in 1992 mandate was to revitalize an ailing, unsafe and undesirable precinct of New York. A not-for-profit governed by a largely volunteer board, the Alliance started from a from the ground up with innovative initiatives and partnerships that could affect long-term sustainable change. Getting clean in new, new ways was a substance abuse organization that lifted a drug index out of addiction. Combating homelessness was a non-for-profit that relocated people to permanent housing. The Alliance also worked with New 42, uh, another non-for-profit, revitalizing and refitting Broadway theaters. They also reignited the city's New Year's Eve celebrations. The Alliance established its own arts agency to engage a growing audience. So su successful were these strategies that visitation um, grew from 30,000 daily visitors uh, to a pre-pandemic high of 450,000 in one day. People for Public Space were commissioned to reimagine the crossroads of the world. And after a review of the precinct, that revealed that the increasing pedestrian demands required an urgent rethink. Recommendations were made, including reconfiguring the roadways, new architectural treatments, and amenities to improve pedestrian experience, and the need to diversify the district's attraction and public space programming. Artists are invited to experiment, innovate, and creatively engage audience in one of the world's most iconic urban spaces. 
Kahindi Wiley did this when he reimagined the American monument with his prophetic rumors of war. And late every evening, artists established and emerging consume the precincts digital advertising boards, Guerrilla Scar, in a program called Midnight Moment. Discovery Green and Buffalo Bio are both park conservancies, which are private, non-for-profit organizations that can support the management, maintenance, capital development, and advocacy for parks and public green space. Each conservancy is a unique model, is unique and modeled to meet local community needs. There's hundreds of these conservancies scattered across the US. The most famous is uh, New York's uh, Central Park. First conceived in uh, 2002 and realized in 2008, Discovery Green is a 12 acre green space that has re-engaged Houstonians with their city and transformed how people live, work and play in the heart of their city. Formerly an eyesore with two large open air car parks that occupied the site that have been pushed underground, allowing the development of an activated urban parkland. With the formation of public private partnerships between the city of Houston and local philanthropic organizations, um, the, Dis the Discovery Green Conservancy was formed. Again, people for public space were involved in um, uh, consultations with the Houston community and um, gathered uh, the gathered feedback was instrumental in establishing the parks programming. Discovery Green has been, become a much loved space known affectionately as Houston's backyard. Public art and programming plays an important role in the success of the Green. Buffalo Bio Partnership believes that public art plays an essential role in the civil discourse of public space. Board member Judy Nyquist talks about the need for conversation, a dialogue with a selected artist to ensure commissions have re relevance to the Bio and to the community. The public art program is delivered through commissioning impactful, engaging and thoughtful, temporary and permanent public works along a 10 mile stretch of uh, the city. Three programs are focused on permanent works, temporary activations and programming, which incorporates performance lectures and events. The commissioning of public art projects does not always follow a prescribed process. At times, it's driven, it's a more visceral experience driven by desire and passion, instinctive. It's an instinctive need to create something extraordinary that will speak to and connect with an audience. Bay Lights is one of these projects and an extraordinary idea dreamed up by Ben Davis, the marketing and comms consultant to Coltrans. Caltrans, a government agency, was project managing the retrofit of the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Ben was thinking about how he could breathe new life into this old 75 year old structure. It had served the city well, well and was being re rebuilt after earthquake damage. How could he reintroduce her to the people of San Fran? One day on his way to the office, he saw the bridge's structure sh shimmering in the early morning light. He imagined the bridge as a canvas of light. And as they say, the rest is history. He shared his idea with a friend who shot back a, an image of herself standing in front of a medallion of light. It was one of Leo Villarreal's works and a connection was made. Ben had never delivered a piece of public art. So in stepped 
um, and certainly not one of the scale he was imagining. So in stepped Amy Pritchett, an executive producer with experience in TV and uh, in, in television and radio and some notion of philanthropy. She says herself uh, when she first heard about the project that this was an impossible dream. But she stepped forward and started to navigate a pathway, both through the design process, logistical issues, and um, funding. It took about two and a half years and $8 million, but uh, the project was built and delivered. It, with uh, half a billion media impressions in its first six months, the Bay Lights quickly became a global sensation. Much loved by locals, they surged to the San Francisco waterfront to experience the work. Local bars and restaurants were rewarded with 30% growth in business. It was initially installed as a temporary work uh, for the anniversary celebrations, but all players realized quickly realized that the long-term benefits of the installation uh, would be great. California, the California Department of Transport, Metropolitan Transport Commission and the City of San Francisco, along with a successful fundraising campaign, um, uh, paid for a permanent installation of the lights. It is now a major attractor for both residents and visitors to the city. Ugo Rondo Nurne's Seven Magic Mountains was also a game changer for me. I first experienced his work in New York, huge, heavy, figurative um, pieces formed out of local rock that were placed on the pedestrian plazas in and around the Rockefeller Center on Fifth Avenue. The next time I saw uh, his, a major installation was at the Rock Band Museum in Shanghai. When I saw his new work, Seven Magic Mountains, appearing on my Instagram feed and in fashion editorials and in flight magazines, I was eager to know more. One smitten viewer called it a sweet mirage of tall stack candy in a desolate desert. Your kids will scream with delight, she said. Ugo visited Jean Dry Lake, the home of land art in the American West in 2012-13. He selected a site that he perceived to be midway between the natural mountains and desert and the artificial, the highway collecting, connecting LA to Vegas. There he constructed seven stacks of boulders, again from locally sourced rock, coating them, but this time coating them with iridescent colors in direct contrast to past works of land art and the surrounding landscape. When Seven Magic Mountains was first installed, Again, it was imagined as a temporary exhibition and only to be only in place for two years. I visited in 2019, a year after it was due to be uh, uh, removed. Um, the uh, work had been repainted, the temporary car park had been upgraded and the exhibition had been extended to 2021. As of last month, 1.6 million people has visited the site and a further 44 million people had experienced the work from the adjacent highway. The Nevada Museum of Art is currently in the process of securing a new permit that would allow Seven Magic Mountains to be on view until the end of 2026. Seven Magic Mountains is a cool, super cool, eye-popping, desert art experience. It provides a counter narrative to the gambling mecca, Sin City monocle that Vegas had. 
It was a canny collab between an artist institution and a non-for-profit profit that led the and the, the non-for-profit that led the charge. Backing up the creative effort was money from a Vegas resort, a gambling tech firm, and a government agency. They were followed by a diverse mix of philanthropic and corporate backers, along with partners like Nevada Commission for Tourism. Such an amazing collection of people to deliver a staggering, successful public artwork. Viva public art. If I'm to imagine Australia's future public art ecosystem, I'd love to see us unshackled from standard delivery models and considering bold new ways to commission. A rich and diverse cohort of government agencies, corporate players and community leaders working seamlessly together. Innovative, innovative partnerships formed to deliver bespoke projects and funding pathways that connect public art to tourism infrastructure and well-being. Thank you. Daniel, thank you. What a fantastic presentation. I wish I had gone on your fellowship trip. That's amazing. Um, what I love about that is the epic nature of so many of these um, projects, but that the community is still being brought into them, which is such a vital part of it, I think. Um, oh, I have lots of questions, but we will come back um, after we hear from our next speaker. So again, if anyone has questions for Daniel, please feel free to pop them down in the live Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll come back at the end. Okay, over to our final speaker this afternoon, who is coming to us from Monday. Uh, this is Jerry Cummings. Jerry is a 2002 Churchill Fellow. Um, he is a stained glass artist and a conservator. And following a three year traineeship, Jerry established his own studio and from 94 to the year 2000 worked on a private commission to create the peace and creation windows in St. Monica's Cathedral in Cairns. I feel like Jerry has something to say about that project. Um, his topic this afternoon is saving Australia's historic stained glass. Jerry, over to you. I'm very honoured to be a guest speaker at this 2021 Churchill Fellowship National Convention. And I particularly want to thank Ken Horrigan and the whole Churchill Fellowship team for their expertise, their guidance, and their straight out determination. I've been making and restoring stained glass windows for 49 years, and Jilly, the love of my life, joined the studio 27 years ago. So between us, we've seen a vast volume of new and restored windows and what is happening across the industry in Australia. The title of this talk is Saving Australia's stained glass windows, with the emphasis on saving. And maybe by the end of this 30 minutes, you may be wondering as we are, whether we are actually saving our stained glass heritage, or maybe are we losing it? To answer that question, I want to talk only to one aspect of the complex issue of stained glass restoration, and that is its very quintessence repainting broken or damaged stained glass. To do that, I'll talk to three topics. Talk about some of the restorations that have passed through our studio. Then I'll ask the vital question by going out of our studio into a couple of churches and ask the vital question, who is monitoring our stained glass restoration? And then thirdly, by way of pure self-indulgence, I'd like to share with you three special restorations that have been in our studio, none of which would have been possible without techniques that we learned on our Churchill Fellowship. So I'll begin by giving you some terms and techniques <clears throat> that are vital for the understanding of stained glass. This is the simplest of all decorative glass forms. You've all seen it. Coloured glass putted into a wooden frame. It's Federation style. It's across Australia. 
This is a lead light. It's held together by lead. It lets light through. It's a lead light. This one is made of five colors. One, two, three, four, five. And every time that you have a color change, you have to cut a separate piece of glass. This is also a, a lead light window. It's a monster that we made in our studio. It's four meters high, three meters wide. And once again, every time that you need a color change, you have to cut a separate piece of glass, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of glass. This is the structure of a lead light window. It's a H-shaped piece of lead. And in the channel, a piece of glass comes in one side, then another piece comes in the other side. That's the structure that holds lead light windows together. Here's Jilly working on assembling a lead light window. A piece of glass, piece of lead cut to size, insert, it at the, insert the channel over the glass, next piece of glass until the panel is completed. Here's Jilly soldering the panel, soldered on both sides, gives it its strength. And finally, putty is forced in the gap between the lead and the glass to strengthen and to waterproof the window. We'll come across that little problem later. So if this is a lead light made in three days, what are we looking at here? This also starts off looking like a lead light. It's every time that there's a color change, there's a different piece of glass, many, many of them. But this is actually the beginning of a stained glass window. Starts off looking like that, ends up looking like that. So what makes a stained glass window what it is, it's because the glass is painted on. Here I'm painting a 1920s replacement piece. And when I've finished the piece, the piece gets put on the trays, the trays get put in the kiln. So what's the glass paint that you use? This row here is glass paint made in the medieval fashion. If it's medieval, got to be simple. Crush some glass. Add a little bit of borax to lower its melting temperature so that the painted glass melts and fuses before the piece of glass you're painting on melts. The colours are simple. Want a rusty red? Go and get some rust. Want some flesh tone? Go and get a bit of clay from the river. Want a brown? Go and look at last night's fire. The next row are silver stains from which the whole industry gets its name. Put silver on the back of a <clears throat> piece of glass, fire it at 600 degrees centigrade, and it turns into this brilliant translucent yellow. On the next shelf here are enamels, a later more sophisticated glass paint, still firing at about 600 degrees centigrade, and it's used for tiny little highlights. So here we are, the hem of a, a garment. This is a piece of clear glass. That's how it starts off. Then using thick gla glass paint, you paint all of the trace lines. Put in the kiln, fire it, 600 degrees. Next day, you take it out and you put a layer of glass paint over the whole of the piece, stipple off what you don't want. When you're satisfied, put it in the kiln, fire it. Next day, not happy with the darkness here, needs another layer of glass paint. Apply a layer of glass paint, <clears throat> put it in the kiln, fire it. Then we want beautiful yellow silver stain on the back. Apply that to the back, put it in the kiln, fire it. Then we want some nice little highlights, some ruby, some sapphires. Paint them on, put it in the kiln, fire it. That's the technique of stained glass. So the question becomes, why the need to repaint? First is obviously maintenance. This window is 1920 windows. It should have been restored 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You can see it's buckling. The leads are fatigued, the putty's worn out. And whenever you have a window that buckled, you can be assured that it is breaking glass. And there it is, certainly. Here we are about to remove a exquisite English window. <clears throat> the 
putty is worn out, the leads are fatigued, and for the few precious moments of lifting it out of its frame and getting it into a styrofoam crate, all that's going to hold it together are the masking tapes. The second reason is quite obvious, breakage. 10 years ago, Julie and I were doing a restoration in Canberra, and we happened to take a photo of this window, beautifully painted, 1960s Australian window. And it was a very good job that we took a photo of it because last year it was destroyed largely in a hailstorm, I think 50 or 60 broken pieces of which this is one and we had a photo by way of reference material. So how do you go about repainting a head like this? First of all, you take the original head, put a piece of tracing paper on the original head, trace off the lines, then you put a piece of glass that Jilly has cut, exactly the right size, amber glass, lay it on top of the tracing, paint off the trace lines. That's why it's called trace lines. When you've done that, fired it, you then start doing the shadows. This is a layer of glass paint all over the face. And if you look carefully here, you can see these are thousands and thousands of dots done by stippling with a brush. So then you get out your paintbrush and you start stippling off the paint that you don't want. Three firings later, and this replacement head is starting to look very much like the original. But the original had this beautiful, unprocurable yellow glaze on the outside. So how are we ever going to reproduce that? Eureka moment. Cut a second piece of glass out of a yellow piece of uh, yellow glass, and then put a layer of glass paint on it, put the original, put the replacement over the plate, put it in the kiln, fire it, lead them up together before and after. Another reason for replacing pieces is poor previous replacements. These are a pair of companion windows. They should be facing each other as companion windows should. Now, I recommend that we all do some neck exercises here because this is going to take a little bit of twisting and turning to work out what this restoration studio did. The body's facing forward, the head's facing backwards. So how did they manage that? Let's have a close look. First of all, we notice in the background that that's not an original piece, that's not an original piece. The head had to be installed inside out because they'd painted the features on the wrong side of the glass. That's why it's facing the wrong way. When they went and get it to fit, it wouldn't. So they chopped off the bottom of their own glass painting and installed a piece of purple glass, no paint on it. Nobody will notice, in it goes. Fortunately, the owners had a fairly furry 1936 photograph of that window, which we were able to use to do our restoration. Talking of silver stain, there it is, beautiful translucent yellow. So, before, after. And we turned the two panels around so that they face each other. There was another clue. If you look here, you can see the end of the scrolls next to each other. And of course, they should be pointing away from each other. Ruined windows. This is the bane of our lives. This is the repeat slide of forcing putty into the gap between the lead and the glass. Sometimes you get a window into your studio and the putty's been totally washed out the leads of fatigue and it literally falls apart. Those little dots there and there are the only specks of putty left. Here, however, we have the main window done by the Irish studio of Harry Clark being dismantled in our studio. The leads had fatigued, the reinforcing had failed, but the glass has mighty, mighty tough putty stuck to its edges. A detail shows the vertical piece of glass, a blade, crunching off the putty off the front, the back, and the edges of every piece of hundreds and hundreds of pieces of glass, a massive undertaking. 
Would it be possible to have a much quicker, easier, cheaper way of doing it? Well, there is. Caustic soda dissolves putty. So what would happen if you took the window and put it in a caustic soda bar, washed it with caustic soda, dissolved the putty, and then you can easily pull the window apart, no chomping, chomping off of the putty. This is a beautiful French window in a cathedral in Brisbane. The studio is famous for its warm flesh tones, beautiful and warm. This is the same window, a different panel, same window, being restored. You can see a couple of epoxy resin strips across it to cover up a crack. And the paint has just about entirely gone. Right back through the trace line, through the four layers of glass paint. Hey, you might say, Jerry, I can see a good solid trace line there. Yes, correct. Done with Dulux by the restorer. He must have known what was happening. This was restored and put back into the cathedral. They paid for it. They paid for their, ruin, their window to be ruined. This is a German window, beautiful craftsman. The priest rang and said, can you come and have a look at our sacred heart window, because the paint seems to be fading. Okay, we're going to have a look. What have we got? There's a detail of the face. It's been caustic soda dipped, and the caustic soda has torn off layer after layer of beautifully applied glass paint back to the raw glass. Here's the window in our studio. A little note, I have to say, the German Romantic style ain't my style, but that's not the question. The question is for a restorer to repaint the original as best they possibly can. So there's the window before and the window after it's been in our studio. Let's ask this horrible question. No, none, zero, zilt, no regulations. So who is monitoring our restoration? Our historian friend in Melbourne knew of a church in Queensland where there was a World War I memorial window. She wanted us to go there, take photos of it for her publication and to buy the superb book produced by the parish historian. So who's involved in this one? There's the church, the restorer, Queensland Heritage. You can wipe out Queensland Heritage's contribution immediately because five restorations were done by the same studio in five years and nobody in Queensland Heritage knew it was being done. So let's have a look at this window that we were asked to restore. You can look here and see immediately all of the trace lines and all of the shades have gone and the silver stain impregnated into the back is still there. You start looking at the face and see it's fading. Haven't we just seen that in the German window? The shell, symbol of St. James, is gone. The dark shadows of the hair is gone. Good part of the shading around the eye, gone. Part of the eye itself, gone. And when you start looking, part of the hair, gone. When you look here, you can see streaks down. Could it be that this window has been dipped in caustic soda as well. We were asked to do a restoration of it. We said, with great regret, sorry to tell you that window is ruined. Finished, put in the bin. While we were in the same church, the author of the book pointed us towards a 127 year old English window. Our guesstimated Replacement value for the window, 74,400. The church thought they had a very, very good job and they put this in their publication saying what these restorers told them they had done. So it needs restoration. Remove the windows washed and clean. Hey, washed. You don't wash stained glass windows. What are they washing it with? Haven't we just seen that? Here's the restorer's explanation to the church who believed it. When washing occurred, considerable colours of the glass faded out. 
Hey, you can't help bad luck, can you? Windows been there 127 years, goes into the Restorer studio and the glass collars fade out. The restorers had a really good suggestion about why that should happen. The external washing of the church walls. Oh, really, really? What could you possibly wash church walls with that would fade the colour of glass? Caustic soda, hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, really? Or at some stage, perhaps, the salt water damage in transit from England? Oh, really, really, really? Wouldn't that mean that every window, every stained glass window coming to Australia from Germany or France or England or America would all have the same defect? Wouldn't it also mean that any stained glass window near a coast would have the same sort of damage? We alerted Queensland Heritage. They sent this letter to the restorer no exemption certificate, no approval from Heritage Queensland. And in future, the department will consider taking further action, including prosecution. Is it the case that this is the first time in Queensland and Australian stained glass history that a department has cautioned a stained glass restorer? Yes, please. Meanwhile, up the road, let's widen our perspective a little. Now we have a vandalised window and we have involved the priest, presumably the wardens, the property committee, the donors, some diocesan oversight, the insurance company, the loss adjuster, Queensland Heritage and three other restoring restoration studios. Let's see how they fail, fail, fared, I should say. We found out from the church secretary volunteered to us that the restoration cost $60,000. Here's an article from a local newspaper saying that the repairs possibly exceed the quality of the original. Well, they would want to be very good because this is a lion and cottier window with some exquisite techniques. We didn't go looking for this uh, newspaper article. It's on the website of the restorer. It was there this morning, it's there. And it's under testimonials. So we, can we dare assume that the restorer thinks that this is an appropriate description of their skill? The other thing that happened was on their website, they've listed the 50 some odd pieces that have been broken and need, re need restoration but no images. Here is the window before, in the vandalized stage and after. Let's concentrate on three details. One's the eagle, one's this bit of costume and one's Christ's head. And let's imagine that the view, the viewers are the committee that needs to approve this restoration costing 60,000 bucks and have a look at what you ended up with. Here's the original lovely chocolate brown glass, lovely olive green garment, and really darkly, deeply painted shadows. Before, after. Lion before, after. Lion and Cotty are known for their beautiful, beautiful soft painting and their flesh colored glass paints. Nice pale green glass, nice soft flesh colored glass paints and brilliant scintillating stains, vibrant yellows. Christ's head, the original, again with lovely yellow silver stain applied to the outside, giving the head a a luminescence and its replacement. When we came to do this talk, we checked our records the last seven years. We've done 27 major restorations done in our studio, seven are unavoidable. 
genuine reasons, and 20 were the results of previous restorations. Where to from here? Finally, I'd like to conclude with three examples of restoration painting skill from our studio, with thanks to techniques we learned while on our Churchill Fellowship. This is a superb piece of painting from Somerville House Girls School in Brisbane. As usual, as you can see, a piece of green glass for the inner lining of the garment, red glass for the outside, but over here, there's this most extraordinarily accomplished piece of glass. Let's have a closer look at it. It started off being a piece of red glass, that big, but the red is just a very thin layer on top of clear glass. So the studio etched off the layer of red so that they now had a piece of glass which was red and the rest of it white. Then they painted the trace lines on, put it in the kiln, fired it. Then they painted the shades on, put it in the kiln, fired it. Then they applied silver stains to the outside, put it in the kiln, fired it. Then they did a superb piece of silver staining, a lemon instead of a yellow, put it in the kiln, fired. This is just amazingly accomplished stuff. And then, because this is the outer part of the garment, this is the lining of the garment, they're going to try and turn that, the same green as the green glass on the other side, with paint. As you can see, the paint's fallen off the top layer, the silver, the, the enamel has fallen off the top. So would we be able to help the, this beautiful old studio out by reintroducing that? Now, we can't put that back in the kiln. Queensland Heritage just suggested we could consolidate it. Consolidate what? Let's have a look at what we could do. What we could do is clean the rest of the failed enamel off. Cut a piece of clear glass, exactly the same shape as the original red and clear piece. Apply two layers of paints and enamels. Put that piece on top of that piece and lead them in together, plating again. And there we are. That's artificially made by painting skill. That's mouth blown glass. Thrilled the bit. Before, after. You all know the old mnemonic. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In the same year. King Henry VII commissioned a nativity window for the successful birth of his successor. It's an angel. You can't find the angel? Neither could we. However, it's part of a series of five panels that does have other angels in it. This is one of the panels. And as you can see, hidden amongst all of the background, pieces, fragments, is the original shape of the top of the window with a pair of paired angels. The paired angels had sisters. We were thrilled to find out, work out that the ones facing the left have got exactly the same face and have variations of curly hair. The ones facing the right have exactly the same face and have flaxen colored hair with variations. That means that we now have enough reference material here to re-recreate the angel that was lost sometime in the last 500 years. This is what that piece of, piece of glass looked like when it was returned to the, to the owner from a Brisbane studio. And this is our replacement. There's the panel. We blacked out the background to reinstate the original header shape. Painted 1492, painted 2016. And the whole sets of panels, original, beforehand, after, before, after. Lovely job.
And last but not least, Catherine of Aragon's coat of arms. As you can see, this is a terribly mangled panel, but let's see what we've actually got here. This is not a semicircular arch. This is a triple headed, cir triple circled Tudor arch. That gives us a clue. These are the coats, the colors of the coats of arm of Catherine of Aragon. That gives us another clue. The thinness of the remaining glass tells us that it's very early Renaissance glass. So we're dating this circa 1530. Can we save it? Fortunately, the owner had this 1927 photograph. And the question now becomes, would Julie be able to paint, cut a piece of glass so perfectly around the broken and missing pieces? Would we have the materials and the skill to paint a stain to within one degree to perfectly match the glass from 1530? Would we dare? And would we be able to, with Jilly's skill, be able to glue them all back together, edge glue them into one piece as it was 1530? Let's have a look. Before, after. You can see there a join, 1530, our restoration. And there it is. The original window we think commissioned 1530, damaged in the 1960s, restored by our studio in 2016, ready to fail, sail into the future. So by way of conclusion, where are we? Are we saving our beautiful stained glass restoration studio production or are we losing it? Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Jerry. What a fantastic background journey. You're really a super as well as an artisan, aren't you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think so. Um, partner in crime is doing my work as well. So we thank you also for, for all your wonderful work. We've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to invite everyone back to the stage. Christina, you're here with us. Yes, you are. Hello. Uh, if there are any questions from the floor, please pop them down into the live Q&A and I will come to you. But I guess to kick off, something that um, seemed really common across all three of our speakers this afternoon is the absolute passion that you have for your work. So I'm going to ask you the really difficult question. Why? Why is this work important? Why is it important to you? So, Christina, I'm going to be mean and go to you first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I've tried to do other things. I, you know, I, I was an architect and I worked in design. Uh, I found that making my work, um, sharing my work is, is my oxygen. Um, it, it's my life force. So uh, without that, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'd be the person I am today. Um, it's amazing to see people uh, connect with uh, the work that, you know, I make. Uh, or if they see one of my works on a building or in an interior, um, you know, the work is like a child. It, it has this life beyond you and, and, uh, and it, it, it's out in the world and it, it, it teaches you so many things, I think, um, and gives back to you in unexpected ways. Uh, yeah, I, it, it's, it's, it, it's who I am. Mm. Wonderful. Jerry, what's your thoughts on that question? A compulsion. When I, when I was eight years old, I just had this compulsion to start drawing. It was forbidden. I used to go to the dunny, which was used to have newspaper sheaths of dunny paper, and I used to draw compulsively on the edge because it was forbidden by my father. That gave me a lifelong quest to keep drawing. <laughs> and also, I think, a quest to find beauty. That's it. 
Daniel? I think um, I come from the maker space, I suppose, and I just love uh, and watching watching Jerry talk about his restoration process and the art of making. I, I love um, being able to assist amplify the voices of artists. So it's that, um, you know, it's the sound of the workshop. It's um, uh, the making of art um, and seeing people enjoy it in the public space, I suppose. Which is something you talked um, a lot about, obviously, in your presentation. Um, you know, I remember from my studies that it is the right of all citizens to be able to contribute to where it is they live, um, that, you know, it's a human right. Um, how do we convince public policy makers? How do we convince the people with the money that this work is important? I think that's a really great question. I think, um, you know, if I... Um, if you compare to societies, the Australian society where we're heavily funded by government and um, and and that's been seen as a great thing um, in the arts, I suppose, uh, for a long time. And then you step into a space in the US um, where, you know, 95, 96% of funding comes from uh, the private sector, whether that's corporates, wealthy individuals, or um, community members. Um, I think there's a space somewhere in between that, which um, uh, allows, um, uh, you know, that we should investigate, um, because um, uh, I'd like to see much more um, um, of the sponsorship and support for the arts in Australia coming from um, the community itself, coming from local businesses, um, coming from the corporate sector. Um, park conservancies in the US um, are run by locals and they manage their own public space. They deliver public programming um, for the local community. So it's by the local community for the local community. And so um, the, the voices are connected and strong. Um, so I think um, that's a really interesting space um, for, for me and uh, I think for us to consider. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, at Metro Arts, we've been watching this kind of steady decline of government funding for many years now. And um, we set about trying to find a new way forward and we set up a, a future fund. So the Metro Arts Future Fund, which has um, $7 million in it now um, preserved. And our idea then is that the distributions can come back and we can commission art and support artists moving forward because I fear um, there's going to be nothing left for the young ones if we don't really take some action now. Absolutely, it's a great initiative. Jerry or Christina, do you want to add something to that conversation? Or not to yeah. I'm very happy to add to that. One of the great tragedies in what I've just been showing you is that most of the money coming for stained glass restoration is coming from private sources, you can imagine. Occasional, occasional grants, but mostly from private sources. In the first church that uh, we showed you today, um, we were there about 40 minutes. At the end of that, most of which was talking to the historian. At the end of it, we were so shocked at what we'd seen. Uh, I thought we'd looked at probably two thirds of the windows very briefly. When we got home, we drew up a floor plan of what we'd seen and a guesstimate of what, what the money values was. Our guesstimate is that the church has spent maybe $150,000 over um, previous years to do $501,400 worth of damage to their own windows. That's our guesstimate. It shocks me when you guys are talking about fundraising, and we are also looking at fundraising from a totally different angle, to see such flagrant waste, not to mention the waste of our heritage and our history 
and our windows. Don't get me started. <laughs> I have a couple of questions from the floor, so I might just jump over to those. Um, firstly, Jerry, this one um, for you quickly. Do you have apprentices working with you and learning from you? We have, we had a uh, excellent uh, young woman or 50 year old woman who regrettably got rheumatoid arthritis. So that was the end of her career, tragic. We are sponsoring a young woman from Melbourne, the only glass, uh, the only glass training, stained glass training workshop in Australia. So we're, we're doing a great deal to try and help her, but it's a very, very specialized field and it's very, very tough going. So specialised. There's another yes. question for you too, Jerry. Um, yes. <laughs> is it possible to get someone at the very top of their field, such as you, to oversee, assess and mediate in the case of works that have been vandalised? Could a well-run heritage department step up and offer support? Gavin wants yes. to Yes, please. As you saw from uh, the presentation, we believe with a great deal of sadness and regret that the churches simply do not have the skill or the knowledge or the expertise to be managing their own windows. It's tragic. We, we, could, we could take you guys on a tour for a week and just show, show you a succession of ruined windows. Horrible. Mm. Thank you. All right, I have one final question. This is to each of our panellists. You've got a minute each only, and then we have to wrap up. So, um, Daniel, I'm going to throw to you first, but the same question to everyone. What is the role of art in an optimist post-COVID world? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> to, uh, you know, to excite, to encourage, to... Um, democratize um, to the conversation to um, help change society um, uh, to um, um, focus on um, the issues of the day and um, and and speak with a loud voice I suppose <laughs> Christina. Uh, I feel uh, you know, uh, art through history has brought people together and, and sometimes also divided people. I think uh, it's the time when art will bring people together again uh, and you, unite us, um, show that we all have, uh, you know, common stories that we share and um, yeah, bring the community together in that way. I think art has a huge role to play in mental health and uh, education and, you know, getting people to express uh, their experience, um, something, you know, sometimes you just can't put into words and something that just has to come out in the materials or what you're drawing. Uh, yeah, it has a huge part to play in the recovery. Mm, I agree. Jerry. I want to go back to your question, Joe, that I didn't answer fully. Oh, sorry. If the, that's okay. Really if, that was my fault. Um, <laughs> if, the church, if the churches are unable to monitor their own windows and they don't have pooled resources to do it, I believe that the only body that I know of with the resources and the skill and I hope the determination to do it is Queensland Heritage or other Queens or other heritage bodies across Australia. For my wish for a post-COVID world, no more ruined windows. Please stop it. Thank you. Please stop it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see all three of our speakers this afternoon. Thank you to Christina. Thank you to Daniel and thank you to Jerry artisans, true artists in your own right. I really appreciate um, your time and the conversation. Now, everyone, if you would like to hang for just um, 20 seconds, 
Ken Horrigan, who of course is our president of CFAQ, is going to um, give a bit of a farewell message. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.